Hello guys and gals, and this is a, a reading of um, an odd bestiary, otherwise known as a compendium of instructive and entertaining descriptions of animals culled from five centuries of travelers' accounts, natural history, zoologies, etc. by authors famous and obscure arranged as an abyssidiary. Um, it was designed and illustrated by Alan James Robinson, and the text was compiled and annoted by Laurie Block. In the last episode, we made it to le the letter K. In the first episode, we basically just went over the, the, in in the introduction. Um, as always, we're going to go over the um, copyright information. I don't know if I did that last time or not. It says here, um, copyright 1982 by Chelanide Press. Print on acid free paper. Um, University of Illinois Press Edition 1986. So, we learned about all kinds of interesting animals. Let's uh, continue this trend. We are to the kangaroo. That's a male kangaroo, obviously. Anyways, um, put a bookmark over there. Kangaroo. June 22nd, 1770. Myself employed all day in laying in plants. The people who were, were sent to the other side of the water to shoot pigeons saw an animal as large as, as a greyhound of a mouse color and very swift. June 25th. I had the good fortune of seeing the beast so much talked of, though, though, but, imperf though but imperfectly. He was was not only like a greyhound in size and running, he had a tail as long as any greyhound's. What to liken him to, I, c I could not tell. Nothing that I have seen at all resembles him. Ju July 7th, we saw four of the animals, two of, of which my greyhound fairly chased, but they beat him owing to the length of the thickness of the grass, which prevented him from running while they, while they at every bound leapt over the tops of it. We observed much to our surprise that instead of going upon all fours, this animal went only upon two legs, making vast bounds, just as the jerboa does. June 27th. This day we dedicated to hunting the wild animal. We saw several and had the good fortune to kill a very large one weighing 84 pounds, called by, by the natives kangaroo. It may, however, be easily known f from all other animals by the singular property of running, or rather hopping, upon only its hinder legs, carrying its forefeet closer to its breast. Journal of the Right Honorable Sir Joseph Banks, 1768-71. to 71. Sir Joseph Banks. And there's a female. As you can tell, because it has a joey in its purse. It's, um, pouch. Different from any... Okay, it says, different from any European, and indeed any animal I have heard of, read of, except the Jerboa of Egypt. Sir Joseph Banks. The Loris. The only other quadruminous animal found in Ceylon as, oh, is the little Loris, which from its sluggish movements, nocturnal habits, and consequent inaction during the day has acquired the name Ceylon Sloth. There are two varieties in the island, one of the ordinary ful fulvous brown, the other larger, whose fur is extremely black, oh, entirely black. A specimen of the former was sent to me from Chilla on the west coast and lived for some time in Colombo. Feeding on rice, fruit, and vegetables, it was partial to ants and other insects and was always eager for milk or the bone of a fowl. The naturally slow motion of its limbs enables the loris to approach 
its prey so stealthily that it that it seizes birds before they can be alarmed by its presence. The natives assert that it has been known to strangle the peafowl at night to feast on its brain. During the day, the one which I kept was usually asleep in the strange posture represented below. It perched firm. It perched. Oh, its perch firmly grasped with all hands. Its back curved into a ball of soft fur, and its head hidden deep between its legs. Maybe we don't have a picture of that. Um, back curved into a ball. Its head hidden deep between its legs. The singular, large, and intense eyes of the loris have attracted the attention of the. Singhalese who capture the creatures for the purpose of extracting them as charms and love potions. And this they say they said to effect by holding the little animal to the fire till its eyeballs burst. Ew. Ceylon, an account, 1860 by Sir James Emerson Tennant. And then there's another picture of it. The loris is about the size of a cat. That's by William Bingley. Manatee. Okay, or the sea cow as we know them. Manatee. We directed our course for a place called Boca del Dragon. In other words, the mouth of the dragon. There to make a provision of flesh, especially of a certain animal, which the Spaniards called mamantines. They are found commonly in such places as under the depths of the water, and are very full of grass, on which, oh, of waters, are very full of grass, on which it is thought they do pasture. These animals have no ears, and only in place of them are to be seen two little, two little holes, scarce capable of receiving the little finger. A man, the little finger of a man, Nigh unto the neck they have two wings, under which are seated two udders, or breasts, which like the breast of a woman. These fishes have the sense of hearing extremely acute in so much as in taking them. The fisherman ought not to make the least noise nor row unless it be very slightly. For this reason they make use of certain instruments for rowing, which perform without any noise. They can they can fright the f that can fright the fish. Meanwhile, they are busied in their fishery. They use not to sp oh, they use not to speak to one another, but all is transacted by signs. Of these fishes, some are found to be of the length of twenty unto twenty four foot. Their flesh is very good to eat, being very like in color unto that of a land cow, but in taste unto that of pork. It containeth much fat or grease, the which, the which the pirates use to melt and keep in earthen pots to make use thereof instead of oil. Um, Buccaneers of America, 1684 by John Esquimling. Esquimling. Let's take a, look, take a look at another picture of a manatee. Looks like we have one right there. Tis a gentle fish. Some say it affects the visage of a man. Sir Thomas Herbert. And I do believe that a manatee was once thought to be a mermaid. If I'm not mistaken. A mermaid. We are to in the narwhal. Narwhal. This singular fish is, is frequent in the northern seas, and sometimes comes as far towards us as Denmark and Sweden, but rarely. The people employed in the whale fisheries frequently kill kill it and pro procure procure oil and sea from it. I don't know what the sea stands for, but okay. As from the common whale. One of these people brought the skeleton of one to London about two years since and sh and uh, shooed it for money under the name of a unicorn. I had an opportunity of examining the tooth in which the great in this t I examining the tooth in this to great advantage and found it 
to be absolutely and entirely such with no title to the name of a horn at all. The tooth was known among collectors of curiosities long before the fish itself, when the creature had been washed on shore and its body destroyed by the waves, the tooth still remained, and its singularity induced anybody that came inside of it to pick it up. Before the fish was heard of, the first conjecture about the tooth was that it belonged to some land animal. It was immediately after declared to be the horn of a unicorn. Medic medic uh, medicinal virtues were then as ascribed to it, and it scarcely made it, uh, and it scarcely made it sell for a vast price. For a vast price, it is but a century ago that there was only two or three of them known of, and one of those, in the cabinet of a German prince, had been purchased at the expense of two thousand pounds. At present, we have scarce any of our collectors without it. And it is so common that it is made, made oh, that as to be made a kind of sign at the door of many of our druggist shops. History of Animals, 1752 by John Hill. The narwhal. And there's another picture of a narwhal. The Frozen Ocean Teems with the Narwhal by William Took. Okay, we are ready for the ostrich. Ostrich, the country, the coast by the river plate, here hereabouts is well watered but without in inhabitants. Here is notwithstanding abundance of black cattle, for which for of which for several scores of, of leagues we observed many herds, with deer also the estridges. We saw a great many of these estridges, and found abundance in of their eggs on the sand for there she drops her eggs upon the ground and and tis said she never takes any far, farther care of them but that they are hatched by the sun and the young and the and the young one so soon as hatched follow the first creature it meets the first creature it meets with i myself have some have had sometimes a great many young estridges follow me. They are a foolish bird. They will follow deer or any creature. The odd birds, oh, the, yeah, the old birds, are here very large. I measured the thigh of one of them and thought a little less, and thought it little less than my own. We had several of them on board, and some we eat, but the old ones were very rank. Coarse food. Some fancy that the ostrich, the estridge, eats iron. I believe just as truly as poultry eats pebble, pebble stones. Not as food, but for digestion. And to serve as millstones or grinders to macerate their food in the maw. The estridge will indeed swallow nails or stones or anything you throw at it, but they pass through the body as whole as they went in. A new voyage and description of Istanbul, uh, oh, of the Isthmus, oh, sorry. Let me reread this. It's really hard to read this font. A new voyage and description of the Isthmus of America, 1699, by Lee, Lionel Wafer. Okay. I wonder if he ever had any wafers named after him. Everyone knew how estridges are shaped, which have a neck, head, and bunch, of, and bunch on the back like camels. Or hunch. Oh, that's not a B, that's an H. A hunch on the back like camels. And when they agree in many things, so that the Turks call them bird camels by Jean Thevern Thever Theverno. The platypus. We are to pee. The platypus. Platypus. The kangaroo, the dog, the opossum, the flying squirrel, the kangaroo rat, a spotted rat, the common rat, 
and the large fox bat, if entitled to a place in this society, made up the whole catalog of animals that were known at this time, with the exception which must now be made of an amphibious animal of the mole species, one of which has lately been found on the banks of the lake near the Hawkesbury. In size, it is considerably larger than the land mole. The eyes were very small. The tail of this animal was thick, short, and very fat. But the most extraordinary circumstances observed it in, observed in its structure was its having, instead of a mouth of an animal, the upper and lower mandibles of a duck. By these, it was enabled enable to supply itself for, with food like that bird in muddy places or on the banks of the lakes in which its webbed feet enable it to swim, while on shore its long, sharp claws were employed in burrowing natur nature, oh, in burrowing nature thus provided for it in its double or an amphibious character. These little animals have been frequently noticed rising to the surface of the water and blowing like the turtle. An account of the, of the English colony in New South Wales, 1788-1801, to 1801, by David Collins. Let's take a look at another platypus. It naturally excites the idea of some deceptive preparation, by George Shaw. Quetzal. Its feathers have made the Quetzal torto, uh, Quetzal Tutatol more precious than gold, and therefore it is called the bird of feathers. It hath a crest, and it is, and is in good part adorned with peacock feathers of the bigness, and is in oh, bigness of a pie or pigeon. I think that's pie. Yeah. Um, it has a crest and is in good part adorned with peacock feather, peacock's feathers of the bigness of a pie or a pigeon, having a crooked yellow bill and feet something yellow. The tail is composed of very long feathers of a shining green and of a peacock color, like for shape to the leaves of, of the flower de luce, or flower de luce. The, fle the feathers of this bird are highly esteemed among the Indians and preferred even before gold itself. The longer ones for crests and other ornaments, both of the head and the whole body, both for war and peace, but the rest, the rest for setting in Featherwork and com composing the figures of saints and other things which they are so skillful in doing as not to fall short of the most artificial pictures drawn in color. Perhaps this purpose they also mingle and weave in together with these the feathers of the hummingbird. These birds live in the province of Tokolo. Tokolotlan. Beyond Quantanmalon. Towards Honduras. Where great care is taken that no man kill them. Or it is lawful to pluck off their feathers. Oh. And so let them go naked. Yet not for all men indifferently. But only for the lords and proprietors of them, for they descend to the heirs as rich possessions. This is from Ornithology, 1678, by Francis Willoughby. Willoughby. And wow, look at those feathers. Woo, wow. Okay. Flowering plumes, sweeping pendant, forming a long train of metallic brilliancy by John Gold. Okay. We are to R, I believe. Ah. Rhinoceros. 
In the country, island of Java Minor, are many wild elephants and rhinoceroses, which latter are much inferior to, in size to the elephant, but their feet are similar. Their hides resemble that of the buffalo. In the middle of the forehead, they have a single horn, but with this weapon, they do not injure those whom they attack, employing only for the purpose their tongue which is armed with long, sharp spines, and their knees or feet, their mode of assault being to trample upon the person and then to lacerate him with the tongue. Their head is like that of a wild boar, and they carry it low towards the ground. They take delight in muddy pools and are filthy in their habits. They are not of the description of animals. Oh, they are not of that description of animals, unicorns, which suffer themselves to be t taken by maidens, as our people suppose, but are quite of, the, of a contrary nature. They are found in this district, district, oh, they are found in this district monkeys of various sorts and vultures as black as crows, which are of a large size, and pursue the quarry in good style. The Travels of Marco Polo, 1854, by Marco Polo. Okay. They didn't know much about rhinos, did they? Okay, and then there's a picture of a rhino. The Forests Are Full of Rhinoceroses, by Robin Morden. If only that were still true. I believe that they are basically about extinct these days. We are ready for sloth. Okay, sloth. The sloth is a four-footed, hairy, sad-colored animal, somewhat less than the ant bear and not so rough. Its head is round, its eyes small, and it has a short nose and very sharp teeth. Short legs, but, extreme, but extraordinarily long, sharp, sharp claws. This creature feeds on leaves, whether indifferently of... Well, well, whether indifferently of all sorts, or only on some particular kinds, I know not. They are not. Oh, they are very mischievous to the trees which they come, and are so slow in motion that when they have eaten all the leaves on one tree, before they can get down from that and climb to another and settle themselves to find another fresh banquet which takes them up five or six days through the trees through the tree stand near, they are nothing but skin and bones. Although they came down plump and fat from the last tree, they never descend till they have, have stripped every limb and bow and made them as bare as, with, as winter. It takes them up to eight or nine minutes to move one of their feet three inches forward, and they move all their four feet one after another at the same slow rate. Neither will oh, neither will stripes make them mend their pace, which I have tried to do by whipping them, but they seem insensible and can neither be frightened or provoked to move faster. Voyages to the Bay of Campeche, 1676 by William Dampier. Let's take a look at another picture of a sloth. There we go. He looks, his looks, his gestures, and his cries all conspire to entreat you to take pity on him by Charles Waterton. Or to tortoise. This will probably be the last one that we read. Tortoise. These animals are found, I believe, in all the islands of the Galapagos. Arch archipelago. Certainly in the greater number. They frequently, in preference, the, the high damp parts, but likewise inhabit the lower and arid districts. Some individuals grow to an immense size. Mr. Lawson had seen several so large that it required six or eight men to lift them from the ground, and that 
some had afforded as much as 200 pounds of meat. The tortoises, no, the tortoise is very fond of water, drinking large quantities and wallowing in the mud. The large islands alone possess springs, and these are always situated towards the central parts and at a considerable elevation. The tortoises, therefore, which frequent the lower districts when thirsty, are obligated to travel from a long distance, hence broad and well-known and well-beaten paths radiate off in every direction from the wells, even down in the down to the sea coast and the Spaniards oh, and the Spaniards by following them up. First discovered oh the the Spaniards by first following them up first discovered the watering places near the spring near the springs it was a curious spectacle to behold mu many of these great monsters one set eagerly traveling onward with outstretched neck and another set returning after having drunk their fill when the tortoise when the tortoise arrives at the spring quite regardless of any spectator, it buries its head in the water above its eyes and greedily swallows great mouthfuls at the rate of about ten in a minute. Journal and Remarks, 1832-32, by, uh, 32 through 36, rather, by Charles Darwin. And let's take another look at a tortoise. It says, most Mariners have long cherished a superstition that all wicked sea officers are at at death transformed into tortoises. That's by Herman Melville. Okay, and when we pick this up, we're going to read about the unicorn. And then maybe go into the bibliography and stuff like that. We don't have much to go, actually. So, anyways, we'll pick this up when we... Where we left off. We've been reading from an odd bestiary. It is a it was um, designed and illustrated by Alan James Robinson, and the text was compiled and noted by Laurie Block. If you like this content, make sure you like and subscribe, and ring the bell so you know when I upload. And if you want to support me in any way, all that information will be in the description below. As always, thanks for watching, everyone, and have a great day.